Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. First of all, I want to uh, give an apology for not doing as many videos. I've just been wrapping up my day job, and I just received my severance. I have severance for basically the next year. So we are going to be moving across the country, and in the meantime, I'll probably do a few more videos, and then there's going to be a period of time where I won't be able to do very many for a while. So I apologize about that, but I'll try to, uh, now that I'm not working, at least for a while, I'm going to try to do more videos. Uh, and by the way, on that topic, I just wanted to mention while I'm thinking of it, uh, this computer that I do videos on, this actually, probably a lot of you have computers like this now. This computer is a, uh, the main hard drive that the operating system runs on is a solid state drive. And then I have a one terabyte uh, hard disk as well. And I just realized when I had a problem with uh, the video card, the uh, HDMI cables were not working. I had to convert over to VGA. I thought I lost the drive. And... I did not realize it at the time until I thought about it that I do have coins uh, that are not because of the type of coins some can't be backed up in the same way as Bitcoin let's say just the wallet <clears throat> I had coins on there that were vulnerable and I just wanted to give this as a warning to anybody that does have a solid state drive you definitely want to uh, get your coins off of a solid state drive because that's basically a chip on your motherboard and if that chip dies, if the controller on it dies, your coins are gone. So I know I'm preaching to the choir and I'm not one who should have to hear this lesson because I've lost so much money in losing or having ha been hacked. But nevertheless, there's another warning. Do not leave your coins unbacked up and on a solid state drive because if that drive dies, they're gone. So we're going to start off with the silver chart and this is an interesting one uh, I've drawn a couple of things here let me get the arrow um, so the main thing is going to be these trend lines that I've drawn and uh, you can see I've drawn a, the main one from the top the 48 or 49 50 dollar price high of uh, the May Smackdown 2011 and the first one comes down to the touch the top uh, touch points uh, which are all the way down here in this year uh, and the other one is the the last time we did that same sort of thing you can see there was a lot of alignment on that thing until we broke out of it and it looked like that was going to be the big one um, but so did this one over here so we've had a couple of false breakouts could this be another one now we've got an interesting spike low there that shows up on the charts and if you remember that was a, f a fake flash crash that created that price spike on there um, so that's more in line with traditional bottoms that doesn't mean that it is but it's definitely in line with the type of thing normally a bottom um, in a market is similar to these spike tops in a market that you get uh, a spike up or a spike down that uh, goes along with it so the question is, sorry, my mic is touching the desk. Let me adjust this. So the question is, is this going to be the big one? Now, looking at the MACD, uh, this is on the weekly. But if we look on the monthly, that was the big one that we were looking at. And we were watching for the crossover of the zero line. So you can see that it's forming kind of a it's almost a pennant sort of thing of the MACD. It'd be very interesting if we got a breakout. Uh, but you can see that um, the last breakout from below the zero line, as I pointed out before, was the beginning of the bull market right there. Uh, this one never went below the line. Not both lines. The blue line did not go through the zero line. Uh, it did here. And that was a result of the bear market that we're currently in. So this will be the second time in recent history if we break through that zero line and the last time we did it we were around five bucks so this could be the big one that everybody's been waiting for uh, 
you know the silver stackers at silver doctors if you ever read the comments on silver doctors those people are so disillusioned it should be called anti-silver doctors because you never read a more anti-silver bunch than the people who are still commenting over at silver doctors do i still believe in the fundamental case for silver absolutely i do i don't regret a penny that i've invested in physical silver uh, i think it's a great savings is it does it even pale in comparison to uh, Bitcoin? Well, they're two different things. But uh, So we're going to be watching this very closely. Now let's get over to Bitcoin because that is where the craziness is going on. Um, almost hit 5,000. 4,970 on Bitcoin. Wow. Is this going to be a correction now? Um, it kind of looks like it uh, just fell off the cliff after it hit that it, it was forming up into a rising pennant and it had this perfect textbook you know breakout above the pennant and it looked like it was just going to explode to maybe even 10,000 or something you can see then a huge sell-off crash so will this down downside continue 5,000 a big psychological marker so you can see on the long-term chart, uh, let's put it on the three-day because that's just too compressed. Um, again, I said parabolic, but the problem with parabolic is you don't know where it ends. Um, you know, it can be like this one and uh, then just slowly drift down and correct the whole thing. Or it can be a crash and we've had those before or it can be like this a correction there's just no way to know now that's bitcoin around five thousand and that's not added in the value of bitcoin cash because you really do have to add those together to get the true value of bitcoin and that puts the bitcoin price you know the pre-split or post-split or however you want to put it um What's that? Forty or uh, fifty-six hundred dollars, probably when this was close to five thousand. Yeah, roughly fifty-six hundred dollar. Uh, that's a lot. Here you can see one seventy-nine thirty-three on the uh, total market cap, and that's uh, well on the way to that two hundred billion mark. So remember, we rallied up to one thirty, we crashed down to sixty or seventy, and now we're back up. Now we're at almost 180 on the total market cap. Uh, there have been quite a lot of performers. Uh, this is this is one that hasn't been a performer, Namecoin. We're going to talk about that issue in a second here. But you can see that uh, over on the U.S. dollar trade cash uh, market here over on Poloniex, you can see uh, Bitcoin Cash um, up up a decent percentage, but. The big winner today is Ethereum Classic. You can see that move, um, Ethereum Classic nearly doubling from the low of 13 bucks to almost 26. You can see Litecoin is coming in at 84 bucks. So incredible move in Litecoin. Um, it took off from that five dollar price in the spring. Pretty much hasn't looked back. Now the high, the old high in Litecoin, uh, I don't think it's going to be on the Poloniex chart. No, because it hadn't been trading it that long. Uh, but the old high in Litecoin was 50 bucks, I think. Yeah, you can see this is an old chart. So yeah, it made that $48 and then it broke through 50 and uh, crashed. Well, this is this ends in July. I'm not sure they were reporting. Maybe they were reporting from BTCE and that's why the yeah, that's a BTCE chart. Uh, so that's why that chart stopped. It stopped when BTCE uh, went down. You, can, you do have a Litecoin US dollar chart here on Bitfinex. I don't know how far back it goes. Okay, so there you go. Is that the longest that we have? Let me see if I, there's a weekly. Yeah, so it shows that high 50 bucks so again litecoin is on the move and uh we don't know when that's going to turn around uh that's a big part of the total market cap as well because litecoin is already up there in the list you can see it's number five 
right behind Ripple. It's four and a half billion dollars, about half of exactly half of Ripple. Bitcoin Cash is now up in third. Ethereum's at 35 billion. Bitcoin Cash is chasing down Ethereum. This is crazy. Bitcoin's up there at 80 billion dollar market cap. Not too long ago, all cryptocurrencies were less than that. So it's just been on a tear. Um, so let's get to what I wanted to talk about tonight. Now, like I said, uh, there's going to be some changes with our living situation. We're going to be moving, and uh, it, it's going to have some impact on the site. Um, it may have some impact on my domain, which is the public domain, and for various reasons, including advertising revenues. And we've talked about Google. We've talked about the control of this whole thing is very sad but uh so there may be changes to this public site as well i don't even know if i'm going to shut it down i may re redirect to the member site um and concentrate my efforts on just the members and not maintain a public blog i haven't made that decision yet but just to let you know that might be coming quite interesting here i just wanted to point out here this is the who is look up for my public domain brother john f.com and you can see that uh, uh, the registrar information, I just wanted you to take a look at this real quick before we get into the story, but you can see that brotherjohnf.com is, I registered through domains by proxy. Uh, that was the, I, it's an extra payment that you make when you're signing up a domain to keep your identity private. Otherwise, they just dump your identity right there for anyone to see, including your home address. Yeah, I know, it's crazy. Uh, and then, uh, so the name service here is Stable Transit. That's actually uh, was from my previous host, uh, which uh, is not is no longer there. Uh, it's now Liquid Web, so it's a different host. But anyway, I just wanted you to see this, so you could see this this DNS sec. You can see DNS sec is unsigned. Now, I didn't want to get into a big technical explanation of what DNS sec is. But it's basically a security level feature for DNS. And uh, if you don't know anything about the internet, basically the DNS system is what allows you to resolve a name to an IP address. Everything that lives on the internet lives on an IP address. But people don't can't remember IP addresses. So they remember names. DNS just translates that name to the IP and takes you there. But the reason I wanted to show you this is to show you how involved the U.S. government is with this. Because most people think the Internet is an international thing. And it is. But not nearly enough. Um, because look at the involvement. Now, if we're just looking at DNSSEC, uh, let's look at what they say here about management of the root zone file. Okay? Uh, and who's in charge of this stuff? I can. I'm sure you've heard of ICANN, right? Well, ICANN's an international not-for-profit corporation under contract from the United States Department of Commerce, huh? Yes, that's right. It might as well be the government. IANA function, IANA stands for Internet Assigned Name or Numbers Authority. <clears throat> ICANN receives and vets information from top-level domain operators, e.g. .com. And the second group here, National Telecommunications Information Administration, NTIA, which is an office within the United States Department of Commerce. Huh? Why would the U.S. government be involved in root servers? Well, we're going to see here in a second. VeriSign, a United States-based for-profit company, is contracted by the U.S. government to edit the root zone with the changed information supplied and authenticated by ICANN. So, uh, and then, of course, fourth, we have an international group of root servers that voluntarily run and own more than 200 servers around the world that distribute root information from root zone file across the internet designated by letter the operators of the root servers are and let, let, look, look at our list here we already saw VeriSign Information Sciences Institute USC hmm, doesn't sound very international to me Koji Communications no US company University of Maryland uh, NASA okay Internet Systems Consortium don't know they are oh there's the DOD and the U.S. Army Research Lab. Oh, okay, now we have Sweden. There's VeriSign again. Ripe in the Netherlands and ICANN. And then there's a Japanese wide project. So we've got Token, Sweden, Netherlands, and Japan. Everything else on the list is U.S. Who runs the Internet? Looks like it's the United States that runs the Internet. That's definitely a problem. 
because the United States is becoming a lot closer to a totalitarian regime every passing day. And that's very dangerous for U.S. citizens, and it's very dangerous for everyone in the world. And uh, let's look at this EFF article here. This is Electronic Frontier Foundation. They basically fight for Internet freedom, which is something that I believe in. I definitely support this group. I think they've done a lot of good work. This is called 10 Plus Years of Activists Silenced. Internet Intermediaries Long History of Censorship. Now, I recently did a video about these, whatever these news articles are, these hoaxes, this racist stuff that I don't really even follow, honestly, because it's such nonsense. But, uh, but they're using it, and here's one of the ways they're using it. Ten years of activist silence. Recent decisions by technology companies, especially upstream infrastructure technology companies, to drop neo-Nazis as customers have captured public attention and for good reason. The content being blocked is vile and horrific. There is growing concern about hate groups across the country and the nation is focused on issues of racism and protest. But this is a dangerous moment for internet expression and the power of private platforms that host much of the speech on the internet. People cheering for companies who have censored content in recent weeks may soon find the same tactic used against causes they love. We must be careful about what we are asking these companies to do and carefully review the processes they use to do it. A look at previous examples that EFF has handled in the past 10 years help demonstrate why we are so concerned. And this is a link to uh, fighting neo-nazis in the future of free expression i suggest you read that as well this isn't just a slippery slope fear of potential future harm complaints to various kinds of intermediaries have been occurring for over a decade it's clear that internet technology companies especially those further upstream like domain name registrars are simply not equipped or competent to distinguish between good complaints and bad in the u.s much less around the world they also have no strong mechanisms for allowing due process or corrective mistakes or correcting mistakes. Instead, they merely react to where the pressure is greatest or where their business interests lie. Here are just a few cases the EFF has handled or helped from the last decade where complaints went upstream to website hosts and DNS providers impacting activist groups specifically, and this is not to mention the many times direct user platforms like Facebook and Twitter have censored content from artists, activists, and others. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce sent a complaint about a parody website created by activist group The Yes Men, not merely to its hosting service, May First People Link, but to that service upstream provider, Hurricane Electric, when the hosting service May First People resisted Hurricane Electric's demand to remove the parody site. Hurricane Electric shut down May 1st People's People Link's connection entirely, temporarily, taking offline hundreds of innocent bystander websites as collateral damage. Shell Oil sent a takedown notice to ISP of activist group Oil Change International after it launched a campaign aimed at Shell's sponsorship of New Orleans Jazz Fest. The ISP removed the site, abruptly halting the campaign. Unhappy with the single document published on the giant website cryptome.org, Microsoft sent, Microsoft sent complaints to Cryptome's domain name registrar and web hosting provider Network Solutions. As a result, hosting provider Network Solutions pulled the plug on the entire Cryptome website full of legal content because the net, Network Solutions was not technically capable of targeting and removing the single document. The site was not restored until wide outcry in the blogosphere forced Microsoft to retract its takedown request. Threats to the domain host of critic of South African diamond conglomerate De Beers resulted in the temporary takedown of a New York Times spoof website that included in part a fa critical fake ad announcing that diamond purchases will enable us to donate a prosthetic for an African whose hand it was lost in diamond conflicts. Swiss bank Julius Baer pressured the domain name registrar WikiLeaks to lock the domain name after the organization posted documents demonstrating financial wrongdoing and then obtained a court order ruling confirming the censorship. 
In response to legal briefs by the EFF and others objecting to this tactic, the district court dissolved the order, leading Julius Baer to dismiss its case. Media giant ABC sent a cease and desist letter on behalf of KSFO AM Radio in San Francisco to the web host of the blog SpockOSBrain.com after that site criticized the offensive and violent rhetoric on the radio aimed at Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi and then Senator Barack Obama. You'll notice that complainers in these cases are powerful corporations. That's not a coincidence. Large companies have the time, money, and scary lawyers to pressure intermediaries to do their bidding, something smaller communities rarely have. The story gets much more frightening when governments enter the conversation. All the major technology companies publish transparency reports documenting the many efforts made by governments around the world to require companies to take down their customers' speech. China ties the domain name system to a tracking system and censorship. Okay, well, is that happening here? Is that what the U.S. is doing? Because as we saw with DNSSEC, you know, everybody says, well, China, you know, they, they censor the internet. Well, it's a different internet. It's, it's uh, we're starting to see now, maybe we don't have the internet. Maybe we have internets and they're controlled by various countries. Russia-backed groups flag Ukrainian speech. Chinese groups flag Tibetan speech. Israeli groups flag Palestinian speech, just to name a few. Every state has some reason to try to bend the core intermediaries to their agenda, which is why EFF, along with a number of international organizations, and it goes on. So, great article, uh, great organization. They're fighting censorship on the Internet. Now, the question is, will they succeed? I don't know, but I can tell you one thing that may succeed, and that would be, again, the answer to many things that we've seen, cryptocurrencies. Now, we have a cryptocurrency that uh, has been kind of in the doldrums, but this is an interesting coin. It's called Namecoin. I've talked about it before. It's actually one of the oldest coins out there. Um, if you go to, you can see here on, I don't know if they still have it here, but if we go to markets here, they still have the BTCE, but it doesn't look like they have the name coin link anymore. Oh, here it is. Here's BTCE name coin US dollar. So you can see that uh, before BTCE shut down, Namecoin actually went on a tear from, it was trading at about 20 cents and it ran all the way to almost four dollars so it, it did nearly a 20-fold move and that was this year and that's a coin based on the DNS naming system so the question is can cryptocurrency solve this problem absolutely they can because they're decentralized anything that's decentralized can defeat centralized control so there can be a coin that allows for name resolution and has domains there. I'm not sure the technical ins and outs of it, whether it's hosted there or how that works. Um, will the sheeple use it? I don't know. Will it compete with the existing internet? I don't know. Uh, I don't use, I personally don't use Facebook. I hate it. I think it's terrible. I think I still have my page. I think it may even post what's on my public blog but I never log into it because it's ridiculous you're giving the entire world all of your identity information people have done crazy things like posted pictures of their kids standing at their house and someone's come and kidnapped their house I mean it's insanity what people give away now will people stop using Facebook I don't think they will even though I think it's monumentally stupid a lot of the sheep are going to continue to use it but there are also going to be a lot of people who will go with something else and that's possibly true with DNS as well so cryptocurrencies definitely have the ability to compete with the mainstream DNS uh, naming uh, convention which apparently is beginning to be take, taken over so that was the whole issue with this uh, neo-nazi uh, site that was taken down was that uh, Charlottesville, uh, GoDaddy and Google have refused to manage the domain registration for the Daily Stormer. Now, what's the Daily Stormer? Neo-Nazi website. And as people have already pointed out, and I've pointed out before as well, that 
if you're looking for neo-Nazis out there in the streets fighting with anti Antifa or Black Lives Matter, whatever they are, whatever the latest, you know, was uh, Occupy Wall Street, whatever the latest ones, you know, the people out there of the left fighting in the streets, people out there on the far skinhead right or whatever, they're probably both government agents out there fighting with each other. And now we see the reason because they're trying to control free speech. And what better way? than to get somebody that nobody will publicly say they agree with, a neo-Nazi. That's the one thing, you know, racist, anti-Semite. Um, that's the one thing that nobody will defend or even uh, be associated with defending. So that's the thing they can use to take away freedom of speech. And that's exactly what they're doing. And, of course, Southern Poverty Law Center, I've already talked about those guys. Those guys are just... Uh, scam uh, basically uh, lawsuit generating uh, frauds that go out and label people as hate group we know that uh, they're being sued now by D James Kennedy uh, at least his ministry I don't know what the basis is I think they're actually suing him for slander or libel or something but they listed them on their sites of hate speech uh, even though they're just a evangelical Christian ministry but they're against gay marriage, so they got on the hate site. But anyway, uh, these guys that run, Mark Potok is the current one, but before him it was Lawrence, uh, Morris Dees, and I followed that guy for three decades. He's, a, he's just a scamming lawyer. That's all he is. Sue people for a living. Um, but these people are trying to shut down free speech, and they're using the neo-Nazi uh, thing to do so. So it looks like we may have another opportunity for cryptocurrencies to fight the powers that be. Bitcoin is fighting against the banks and apparently winning because the combined value of those two is approaching $6,000. Uh, I would say that that is, seems to be winning the war. Uh, on the other hand, Namecoin does not appear to be winning at all long-term chart. Now, I haven't done the study to see how many name resolution coins are out there. I would imagine there are others. Uh, I've been told that Ethereum can do this, a similar sort of thing. I don't know. But uh, so I may pick up some name coins as a fundamental investment just because it may take off in the wake of this, uh, this name stuff. And uh, once again, silver may take off i think if we get across through that zero line on the monthly macd it's probably going to be another one of these off to the races where did we go we went tenfold where will we go we could go tenfold where's that going to put us about 175 to 200 dollars an ounce silver and we'll talk to you next time